My name is Matthew Spoke. Um, I'm a co-founder and the CEO of a Toronto-based company called Nuco. Uh, I'll walk you through a little bit about what we do, um, but generally it's good kind of uh, segue from Michael's presentation. So we're a blockchain infrastructure company, uh, focused very much on kind of the broader application of this technology rather than the specific application of a payments technology. So you know, a lot of people hear about blockchain in the first you know, first time in the context of Bitcoin, in the context of payments, in the context of financial services. Um, what I'm going to walk you through is a little bit of, you know, what we do specifically as a company, but also the broader applicability of blockchains as just an underlying technology that can enable a whole transformation of a number of different industries. Um, so that's a little bit about, about me. We've been operating for about a year now. Um, prior to that, uh, I started my career at Deloitte. I'm a chartered accountant. Um, spent my last two years at Deloitte leading a blockchain R&D team for Deloitte. So Deloitte originally kind of picked up on this in 2014. I wrote a proposal for our executive back then around Bitcoin and why Bitcoin was going to specifically change the role of auditors and accountants and you know, financial, financial reporting in general. Because the moment you had these transparent ledgers of information, why did you need to you know, engage a third party to come tell you that the information was trustworthy? So that really caught their attention. They you know, invested in, in us having a team for about two years. Uh, at which point I left the firm last year to start Nuco. So that's kind of my background a little bit. Um, basically, you know, I'm going to frame this for you in the context of decentralized systems and applications. So um, you know, probably the thing to focus in on here is this topic or this concept of decentralization. Today, you know, the way that, that Michael explained it around um, you know, this perimeter security, all of that is based on the fact that we build and maintain centralized systems, systems that are owned by individual companies, and that to secure them, we wrap these you know, moats and, and walls and you know, put spikes on our fences, et cetera, to keep people out. But everything is built around centralized systems. So today, when you want to interact, whether it's a financial transaction or something else, from one centralized system to another, we do that through intermediaries because both of these centralized systems don't inherently trust each other. So they then nominate a third party to be the trusted intermediary to a transaction. So, you know, simple example in payments, think of uh, the Canadian banks creating Interact as a payment system so that they could, in, you know, transact and, and send small transactions back and forth between bank accounts, between RBC, TD, CIBC, whatever. Without Interact existing, Prior to this technology, that would have been impossible because RBC doesn't trust TD and TD doesn't trust BMO and vice versa. And there's this enormous army of people that just are in charge of reconciliation. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit about that. Uh, the landscape of the industry is you know, kind of emerging now that there's this enormous amount of interest in how this technology is applied as an infrastructure, meaning think of it as the next generation of database technology. So Oracle as a system or Oracle as a company provides database solutions and ERP solutions for industries as broadly different as healthcare to supply chains to government services to financial services uh, to whatever the case might be. They all kind of root themselves in very similar technologies, which are databases. So in this case, what we're proposing is that this is kind of the next iteration and next generation of these database systems. They just happen to be more open, more decentralized and more along the lines of sharing rather than securing. Um, so basically what we do as a company is we build networks. We build networks of, you know, the way uh, Michael illustrated this was nodes. So endpoints on a network being computers or servers that have to connect each other to each other on a common protocol, meaning how do they interact and communicate with each other. So we've built kind of this protocol for these servers to communicate with each other. Once we have one of these networks in place, then what we can start to do on top of these networks is create um, you know, logic, create intelligent applications that can do things that are shared processes between these endpoints on a network. So that can be a payment. It can also be the sharing of medical information or the exchange of stocks. Uh, whatever the case might be, it's anywhere where you have multiple parties interacting on a common process. And I'll walk you through a few examples to illustrate that a little bit more. But then the end goal is not kind of a one-to-one -one relationship is how do you take this and you kind of span it across industries? How do you take this from one bank to another bank to the entire global banking industry or one hospital to another hospital to the entire you know, Ontario-based healthcare system? So that's kind of what we're focusing on is the scaling of that infrastructure so that we can create more streamlined processes that still secure the information, still allow you all the privacy you need, but eliminate unnecessary steps in the middle, these frictions that exist today that are really there as a result of technological shortcomings most of these intermediary organizations that we're talking about, if they don't have an added value proposition other than we exist because of a technological shortcoming, then they start to have to re-envision re what they do as an entity. Um, and you know, the early days of Bitcoin, the early days of blockchain technology in general, it was very kind of aggressive to the established 
industry participants. You know, the banks were going to get disintermediated or insurance companies were no longer going to be relevant or whatever the story was. You know, we look at it a little bit differently. We look at this as being an enabling technology for industries to kind of reinvent themselves and really figure out what is their value proposition and focus in on that and not just provide kind of services that, that bridge gaps between technological systems. So that might mean that in one context, the bank is the intermediary between a business to business transaction. In another context, the bank might be the endpoint in the system and the intermediary is the clearinghouse or the payment processor or the credit card company. So depending on what layer you look at, there's always kind of somebody who is providing an intermediary service. And if you look at that from start to finish, that means we've got layers upon layers upon layers of intermediaries that participate in any one transaction or any one kind of normal interaction that you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so for those of you less familiar, this is kind of a couple of high-level stats of what's going on in the industry. Uh, trying to focus here on the fact that you'll notice these statistics are not only financial services related. So these are estimations and research studies that are happening around why blockchains are going to matter in pharmaceutical counterfeiting or uh, trade finance and supply chain, uh, reinsurance markets, fraud in healthcare, obviously back office bank savings, internet of things. So it's this enormously impactful technology and the reason that I get so passionate about it is because we hear of all these really high growth potential technologies like robotics and, and artificial intelligence and uh, you know, deep learning, whatever the case might be, quantum, all of these technologies are rooted in the fact that somewhere along the way there is, a, there is a set of data being stored and used in a new way. AI is built on traditional databases. AI is how do I consume this data more efficiently and, and lead to kind of insights that I can then act on. What we're talking about here is a fundamental change in the way that we store and use and create data. So it's kind of this fundamental layer that I view as being kind of underlying all of this next generation of technologies that are emerging, where you're going to have artificial intelligence built on top of blockchain systems. You're going to have um, you know, robotics that are individual entities. Essentially, these machines will be able to transact with one another over blockchain systems. You're going to have all of these technologies that are enabled by this being the underlying kind of infrastructure. So keep that in mind as I walk through this. You know, a little bit about us at Nuco. Um, you know, young company, we kind of very, very quick glimpse into how do we go to market. We work di directly with enterprise clients. We've got a couple of ongoing projects right now that are in the pipeline to be announced. So this is how do we help redefine the business process around a specific industry and design it in the, in the way that we can kind of build it over a blockchain and create kind of the, the distributed version of a formerly centralized system. Um, Scaling through partnerships, we, the fact that we, me and my two co-founders started at Deloitte, we very quickly turned around and signed a partnership agreement with Deloitte's technology consulting firm, negotiating similar agreements with other technology integrators, Accenture, Cognizant, companies like that, so that they can use our software as they go out to market. Uh, and empowering an ecosystem is really application companies out there that are saying, hey, I want to build the blockchain company that does health data. All of them have an in inherent infrastructure requirement in how they build those systems, so we're making our software available to other software companies. So, you know, the, the simple analogy for people who are less familiar with kind of the tech space, because everybody's got an iPhone or something similar in their pocket. If you think of kind of three layers of engineering, when you think about the typical app you use on your iPhone, somebody built the user interface, you know, somebody built that, that you know, appealing uh, screen that you're looking at when you're playing a game or accessing your email or whatever you're doing. Somebody built the back-end system behind that user interface. So that means that somebody had to build the logic that sits behind your game or your email system. But somebody else designed and developed iOS, which is the Apple operating system. So what we're really positioning ourselves to be is kind of the iOS layer of this technology so that other companies can build their applications on top of us. Um, so, you know, that's simple analogy for you guys to consider. I'm going to walk you through three basic use cases that I've illustrated very simply that we're currently working on um, that are not traditional payments use cases. Uh, there's a few others that if, we're, you know, if we have time, I can walk through. But just basically speaking, this is a project we're working on with Deloitte right now in trade finance. Um, if you think about a very complicated international trade transaction, meaning a uh, North American uh, importer wants to buy goods from a Chinese exporter um, and all of the parties that are involved in that process. So very, very simplistically, that at the very least includes an importer, an exporter, at least one bank on each side of the transaction financing the import, financing the export, and at least one logistics company in the middle 
and every layer of customs documentation and you know, whatever approval process that needs to happen for goods to move across borders. So what we built with Deloitte and that they're now deploying with a group of Hong Kong banks is essentially a trade finance system that says, well, from the creation of a purchase order all the way through the confirmation of delivery, every step that today is paperwork can be automated on a blockchain network where every one of these companies is an active participant and they use something we call smart contracts that uh, Michael referred to earlier to automate that process. So I'll, I'll walk you through a little explanation about what a smart contract is and how it functions. But generally speaking, think of this as in the same way that we have these boxes of data that we were talking about before, boxes of transactions. Here we're looking at every single transaction being a change in the state of a process. So a change in the state of a process can be that I create a transaction and then party number two has to confirm that they agree with the details of the transaction and party number three has to confirm that they agree with the details of the transaction. All of these are kind of state changes for a transaction to go from creation all the way through the confirmation. Every one of these state changes is acted on by a different party in the transaction, right? So, um, you know, the, the importer says, hey, I want to buy some widgets from China. They create a purchase order. That's step one. They then go to their bank and say, would you be willing to finance an import of a million dollars worth of widgets from China? And then the bank has to say yes or no, and here's the terms of my financing, et cetera. So that's step two. Once the bank has agreed to finance that transaction, then they have to send the purchase order to a relevant exporter who has to say, yeah, I agree with your your order of a million dollars worth of widgets, I'll process those, that's step three. So you can think about this as kind of like a one step at a time, we're going through any type of transaction that kind of follows that, that sequencing. So every one of these parties has kind of a role to play in processing it. Next use case that we're building right now, we haven't announced our, our client on this one yet, but we're building a commodity settlement system in uh, uh, specifically in a liquefied commodity. So we're, we're dealing with pipelines, the exchange operator and buyers and sellers in this market. Um, eventually looking to open this up to include regulators that are involved in this market. So uh, again, think about this as today a very fragmented industry that looks like a producer of this commodity, a buyer of this commodity, uh, an enormously fragmented network of pipeline operators. In some cases, 20 or 30 pipelines will touch any one transaction moving from supplier to buyer, um, meaning everybody is kind of creating and maintaining their own record of that deal. There is no one seamless view of this transaction happening. The exchange does not have a perfect view of the transaction happening. The individual pipeline obviously does not. And the buyers and sellers are kind of blind to the fact that after I ship it out my door, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that it gets there, but I don't know until I get a confirmation from the other side. So what we've created here is a system that essentially says, well, let's use a blockchain as a single source of truth, a single record of this transaction happening where every single party in this chain of custody essentially updates the network when they've completed their part of the transaction. So the, the, the supplier's role is to ship it out the door. Pipeline number one's role is to take it from the supplier and pass it off to pipeline number two, and et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. And we can have all of these things operating as kind of state changes so that when I look at the, the sequence of this transaction, I can see that it's 50% complete or 75% complete, or something went wrong and a red flag goes up you know, more quickly than would be the case today. Um, you know, I, met, I touched briefly on the fact that, you know, this and most other use cases we're looking at have a very, uh, you know, they have a regulator implication. Depending on what market it is, the regulator changes, obviously, by jurisdiction and by asset class and all these things, you know, uh, impact who the regulator is. But what really excites me about this is one of our biggest target markets is actually government agencies and regulators. Because this is not only a, transa a transaction system that makes it more efficient for companies to interact with each other, it's actually a transaction system that makes regulations an automated process that don't require human in interaction. You know, I'm a CA, as I said, that means I've spent a lot of time in the world of audit and tax reporting and compliance and CRA involvement. That's a really expensive process, not only for the private sector on the one side of the transaction, but also for the government sector on the other side of the transaction that has to process these annual filings and go through annual audits and do this expensive process of verifying that companies are compliant to the rules. And whether those rules are tax rules or uh, crude oil trading rules or uh, securities exchange rules, different regulators, but still very heavy involvement from a regulator. So if I can automate the process and make it extremely transparent such that the regulator can see it happening in real time and collect the information they want from the transaction itself, you might be able to, in a very medium to long term future, five to 10 years from now, eliminate the human process of regulatory compliance because it'll happen automatically in the software. 
and everybody can have confidence in this happening because it's being recorded on one of these decentralized ledgers that is immutable, nobody could fake the, the transactions, et cetera, all the stuff that Michael was talking about earlier. So I think there's an enormous, you know, enormously important uh, side benefit there. Third use case, just to show you another industry that we're working in is, is around prescription fraud. So um, in this context specifically, we're looking at how does, um, how does a pharmacy in certain jurisdictions know with certainty that the document you walked in with is actually a legitimate prescription from a legitimate certified doctor and that you're not duplicating that prescription or trying to get drugs to sell into the black market or whatever the case might be. So now the issuance of prescriptions is being treated as a transaction being recorded on the network. So the doctor can say, yes, I've legitimately issued a prescription document to you know, patient X and the pharmacist can verify that patient X has a legitimate prescription and hasn't already used it. So this concept of a double spend in Bitcoin can also be equally applicable in something like, hey, I want some Oxycontin and I wanna make sure I'm not double spending my prescription on Oxycontin at two different pharmacies. So you know, there's a little bit more um, you know, breadth in terms of how this technology might impact another industry. I'll give you a quick little glimpse into how we're positioning ourselves as a company. Uh, you know, for those of you who are somewhat familiar with tech, you might recognize some of these larger companies. Um, essentially, there's a lot of open source development happening around this software. Um, and there's enormous industries that have been built now in the concept of open source software. So you know, in big data, you've got companies like Cloudera that just recently announced that they're going public. Companies like Heroku around enterprise cloud services and companies like Red Hat around enterprise operating systems. And we're kind of positioning ourselves to say, you know, there's an enormous amount of value and potential happening in the blockchain industry, but somebody needs to package it for the consumption of enterprise. So we're packaging it for the consumption of enterprise. Um, you know, I won't bore you on this because essentially it's kind of our technical architecture, uh, but happy to talk about this if you have any specific questions. Um, but that's, that's us. I mean, the, the one concept that I wanted to kind of leave you with is, is Michael kind of illustrated how the Bitcoin style blockchain of financial transactions work. And then he alluded to this concept of smart contracts. So smart contracts are, are this kind of other generation of blockchains that emerge to say, well, you know, I want to be able to do financial transactions, but I also want to be able to put some you know, intelligence on top of this transaction. So not just, hey, send $1 from A to B, but send $1 from A to B after a certain amount of verifiable criteria have been met, but allow those criteria to be verified by software rather than verified by humans. So today, if you want to create some sort of, uh, you know, insurance contract that says, well, you're going to get paid out on your policy if this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens, that's a human process, right? Somebody's got to go verify that these things have happened. So what a smart contract essentially allows us to do is automate a lot of these things, automate a lot of these processes that today take human involvement and tomorrow can simply happen in terms of like verifiable software saying if your insurance contract requires the weather to drop below zero degrees for 10 days straight, that's data you can pull in from a trusted weather source, right? You don't need somebody to go verify this. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the general concept. So smart contracts, think of them as, you know, automated intelligence on top of a blockchain um, that allows us to do a lot of these things. So anyways, that's my presentation.